Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 424, the podcast and the YouTube video. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today is August 3rd, 2018. Okay, we're here covering the, re- the current and ongoing recovery of George. George, uh, you've had sepsis, you've recovered, you've taken lots of antibiotics. Uh, it takes a long time to, to get better, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I am I basically hit a wall around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Uh, before that, I've got energy, enthusiasm, all these things I want to do, and then comes lunchtime, and I'm dead for the rest of the day. Uh, I've been adding about an hour or two every few days to that strength schedule. Mm-hmm. I had five sermons on Sunday to deliver, plus a class on Exodus 3. And I have to tell you, Monday I couldn't move. Uh, uh, yeah, I just don't have the, uh, just don't have the pop and the zing. Well, the doctors tell me it'll come, but it just will take time. Five? Don't you have some uh, deacons you can pass this on to? Well, here's a joke. I actually this was quite disturbing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Sunday before last, uh, I had to pass because I was still in the hospital. Sure. And so we switched it to uh, morning prayer, all the services, or evening prayer. And attendance fell by 45%. Now, that tells me either I've created a little cult of personality and people just come to be entertained by me, Uh or we have incredibly broad but shallow. uh, uh, I don't know what to make of that. But I really, but basically I met with the wardens this week and because I had a vague, I took two weeks when we went to Jerusalem. I took That's two right. Sundays off. Sure. We had the same phenomena. When mm. I'm not here, this place falls apart. Mm. That's not a good thing. <laughs> no, not a good thing. You, you have to work on that. Um, there's another person in charge of a big church that we need to talk about. Uh, uh, a little Pope issues going on. Uh, so before we get to that, please pray for George and his continued recovery. Uh, my son finally got a job. Yay! He's going to be at the wait staff at the local uh, Sea Breeze Pizza. That should be a lot of fun. So, oh, I mean, wow. well, he, I mean, his hobbies are watching YouTube. His uh, his interests are watching YouTube, playing Halo. Uh, so it's going to be nice to finally get him out of the house. Uh, his senior you year of high school. Think about it. He'll just bring home the leftovers at the end of his shift for you. It's much better than Michaela, who worked at a bakery, and she would break home. Uh, every every week or every couple of days, she'd bring home the mistakes, and basically it's sugar. And I, you know, now that she's gone, uh, my diabetes is poof gone. George, let's talk about Pope Francis, the you Episcopalian and, Pope. Uh, the Episcopalian Pope. You and I differ a little bit on the death penalty. I, you know, I if if the state wants to kill somebody, I'm not a big deal. It's okay, whatever. I couldn't do it. I couldn't condemn a person to death if I were a judge and uh, doing murder trials. The person wouldn't be going to death row. It's I just couldn't do it. You, on the oh, other hand, it, probably it's that Midwestern liberal ethos that you were reared in. I was just reared as a Minnesota out. liberal, and you know, a Mondale guy. Come on, it's <laughs> Mondale Carter, uh, and so. I just, it's not like I'm a peace activist or something like that, but um, I just couldn't condemn a person to death. You, on the other hand, probably doesn't, don't have a big problem with it. No, I live in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I believe, now, we, we need to distinguish because there are lots of topics here. There's the morality of the death penalty. Mm-hmm. There's the proper use of the death penalty. Yes. I'm well aware and of uh, miscarriages of justice where crooked judges, ambitious prosecutors, and god-awful defense attorneys can let an innocent man or woman be sent to the electric chair. It's happened too many uh, times. We're not talking about that. No. Uh, I'm, t- we're t- I'm talking about does the state have the right to take the life of a con- guilty man or woman in, in expiation of their crimes as punishment? I believe it does. Okay. So, this has been turning around politically for a long time and the world kind of goes back and forth on it because they see how it's been misused in the past and uh, how communists have misused it socialist democratic socialist countries have used it to kill political prisoners Uh, anybody who's read the gulag of archipelago certainly knows that it was used 
uh, in early Soviet Union to kill political prisoners. Um, the death penalty has been misused in many ways. However, within Christian theology, um, at least since Augustine, there has been a, a defense of it. If the state needs to, and the state wants to, the church should allow for it. And that's existed now, what, 1,300 years? So, well, actually, Kevin, if you keep pushing it back, the Old Testament, there's no question about the death penalty. <laughs> okay, the Old Testament, yeah, I mean, I, I just Absolutely. want to talk about it in the Christian church sense, but, you well, know. Even, even if you look at the New Testament, uh, when mm -hmm. Jesus is brought before Pilate, Pilate essentially says, I have the right to condemn you to death. And Jesus responds, that is not your personal right, but the authority has been given to you to do this from above. Mm -hmm. Christ recognized in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for our Episcopal readers, those are the four Gospels, uh, that the, state, the death penalty is a proper function of state authority. Now, Christ, his uh, sentence was unjust, it was an abuse of authority, but even in the Gospels, Jesus recognized the lawfulness of taking life. City of God, St. Augustine talks about the proper use of the death penalty. Thomas Aquinas, both in his Summa uh, Theologiae and Summa Contra Gentiles, writes about the uh, moral and theological uh, truthfulness of the death penalty. Council the Council of Trent, Trent. Yep. the Catechism of the Council of Trent, sort of the lodestone mm -hmm. of Catholic moral ethical teaching says the death penalty is okay every pope what number is francis kevin he's 266. okay well 265 popes <laughs> have been wrong <laughs> you know, in 1952 pius XII gave a speech on the death penalty and he clarified the catholic teaching which is you know use it sparingly use it properly use it in right order no nazi and communist yeah. shooting people shoot yeah. people but rather when improperly used, the state has the right to take the life of a person because that person, by his crime, has forfeited his right to life. And he is expiating his guilt by surrendering his life by the action of the state authority. So all of a sudden, Francis this publishes this week. Now, isn't it a remarkable coincidence that the church is imploding over homosexuality at the top of crooked cardinals and and gay cliques, they come up with something that will just totally wipe that out of the media and put in a new topic to discuss. Wait, it, you're saying this is the Roman Catholic version of Wag the Tail, or Wag the Dog? I'm saying this is Francis being the Episcopalian that he is in his heart. In other words, Francis, for 255 popes, black and white issue, they were white. Francis is saying they were all wrong. Yeah, and they're that's all wrong. the Council of Trent is wrong. Thomas Aquinas is wrong. Augustine is wrong. Our Lord didn't have the sensibility that I have, and it's the same way the Episcopal Church operates. That oh, God is calling us to do a new thing to have transgender uh, priests or yeah. gay married priests and this and that. If Francis can do this without calling a council, without uh, having any major consultation. What is to prevent him from, John Paul II said, no women priests ever. Francis can say, oh, I think it's time. Well, and these are the big things because early on in my uh, Christian development, somebody tried to explain dogma to me. Okay, and he, he explained it as dogma is the, the Pope can create as he goes. If he finds mm -hmm. something uh, new and nouveau that he wants to institute, um, He's welcome to do it. The church allows for it up to a certain point. And I remember Pope Benedict trying to draw the line at, at that point saying, you know, a pope can't do exactly this. All of a sudden, all of a sudden create something new. Fra uh, Vatican I in the 18, I believe, 70s. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact date off the top of my head. Vatican I limited and explained the authority of the pope. The pope can speak de fide as a matter of faith on certain limited areas and he must do so as part of the wider magisterium he, he just the pope is not the president of the mormon church a prophet where the mormon church in the 19th century after the united states government sort of got involved the prophet president of the mormon church woke up one morning and said god just spoke to me and said we're no longer to be polygamists his name was joseph smith ah you know 
Francis is acting like a Mormon. Mm -hmm. Francis is acting like an Episcopalian. He's following the social ethic of the times, and then he's being sneaky. Now, what do I mean by sneaky? The Episcopal Church wants to change the doctrine of marriage. Well, they don't debate the topic. They don't go into any deep study. They don't send it out into the church. They decide, well, let's change the doctrine of marriage by saying, uh, in our prayer book, if you take who will take the, this man and this woman to person A, person B, and by that sleight of hand, without going through the proper channels, they've upended marriage. Francis is editing the catechism to say the death penalty is inadmissible, meaning always and everywhere for all times wrong. Problem is, the catechism of the Council of Trent says always, everywhere can be right. So Francis, in essence, is abrogating the Council of Trent. He's abrogating the First Vatican Council, and he is—he's doing it the Episcopal way. Okay. Well, now there's a lot of people who would say, "Yeah, but this is Pope Francis. He meant well. He comes from a socialist country. Um, he was raised differently. He probably hates capitalism. Probably loves taxation, uh, and probably just doesn't speak in the." Uh, the Roman way we're used to. And so he meant well, and if he meant well, he said it wrong, George, what should he have said? Well, Francis should have said, I believe the Anglicans got it right when they said in the, in the Articles of Religion 37. number 37 that the magistrate <laughs> has the authority to put men to death. Uh, they don't say anything about women, so I guess uh, women well, can't be executed. But no, apart from Francis saying, you know, I really am a secret Episcopalian, let's just go whole hog. Francis would say, I urge states and jurisdictions to uh, use mercy, and these are the reasons why I agree. Francis didn't do that. No. He basically said, I'm boss. This is what I say, do it. No arguments. Well, well forget, forget, you know, uh, this will sort of titillate the left-wing media, who otherwise can't stand the Catholic Church, but it'll say to faithful traditional Catholics that the faith in which I have stood, that bedrock, that unchanging uh, doctr uh, dogma and doctrine which develops over time in conformity with its past, is now up for grabs because who's ever boss can do whatever the hell he wants to do. Well, other than Vatican II, what's the biggest liberal step that the Roman Catholic Church has taken? Liberal step? Well, in Germany, uh, they now have, uh, uh, you can have bring your Protestant spouse to Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. In other words, you don't have to be Catholic in good standing to go to Holy Communion anymore. They are uh, opening the door, they're rethinking the whole issue of homosexuality. Of, is this intrinsically disordered, not part of God's plan, to the Episcopal way, if we need it to find a pastoral solution, to basically be nice to all the homosexuals within our ranks, and allow them to have the full expression of love and God's tenderness and decency. Now, these are all moving very rapidly through the system, and it's happening in some places more than it's not happening in Poland, okay? But it is happening in Germany, in South America. Um, you know, here, here's something to consider, and these are hard, nasty numbers, and it'll offend some people. The Catholic Church in Honduras went from being about 95% of the population in the 50s to less than 50% today. It's a major Honduras is a majority Protestant country. Why is that? Did all of a sudden people wake up and say, "My God, John Calvin was right"? No, no, they did it <laughs> because the Catholic Church was so corrupt, so moribund. Right now, there's a major scandal where 60 seminarians have signed an open letter saying that the seminaries in Honduras are gay dating societies. They're not gay, and they are being ostracized and kicked out for not being part of the gay culture. And the Cardinal of Honduras is one of the Pope's senior advisors. And the Episcopal Church in Honduras is doing fantastically well. And it's made up of ex-Catholics who are sick of a corrupt uh, and, and broken church. Now, the ACNA is made up of ex-Episcopalians who are sick of being in a corrupt and broken <laughs> church. So, all politics is local. No, no it long. is. No, I mean... But, but, I mean. The, but the point is, the Catholic Church 
you know, from my perspective, from where I am, and I know our friend Gavin doesn't agree with me on this point, is actually in far worse shape than the Anglican world. The Anglican world, we've just been public about all this. We're like that family at the next table in the restaurant who are arguing at the top of their lungs. Well, well, we're even more dysfunctional. We're just quiet about it at our table. No, I, the, there's a lot of truth to this. Uh, uh, the entire church uh, is having cultural difficulties. And, you know, how much they want to adapt to society. And I see this as a big adaptation for Pope Francis saying that, you know, it's a new <laughs> time. We have a better ability to house our prisoners. We should not have to kill them. I, I agree and I disagree, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I agree when you because the St. Uh, Paul Star Tribune or whatever, one of the, the big newspaper across the river. Minnesota. Many, yep. Minnesota. Minnesota. Had this long series about the death of the church in Minnesota. And mm -hmm. it was out all these poor Lutherans and these poor Methodists and Catholics that just have these empty buildings that are all rattling around. And oh my, we don't understand why the church is dying. Well, they neglected to mention the fact that the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostals, the Church of... Uh, there are churches that are growing by leaps and bounds in Minnesota. Uh, people talk about the death of the Episcopal Church. Well, yes, you go to parts of the country, it's just three old ladies and a cat. Um, other parts, it's alive and powerful and dynamic. And what it is, is, this is my prejudice, of course, but it is where the gospel is lived and preached and celebrated. When a church forgets the Bible and starts preaching what's in the New York Times Sunday op-ed page, of course it's going to die. And that's happening not only in the Episcopal Church, but in the Catholic Church um, and, many, and the mainstream uh, Protestant churches. Not everybody's dying. No, where the gospel is preached, it does continue to live. Uh, and, you know, Midwestern Lutheranism is a perfect example of how to kill a church. You know, that they went super liberal on lots of different issues. Uh, the Episcopal ch Church joined them. Uh, the Presbyterian Church is not far behind. And boy, those United Methodists, are, they're going to catch up in no time and, you know, be the super liberals too with empty churches. Well, these, you know, kind of newer uh, churches, uh, what's it called? Not the vineyard churches, but uh, these you know online churches are taking over uh, in in rural America, and and vineyard churches and these mm -hmm. various churches and even even ACNA churches, even some Episcopal churches, even some Presbyterian churches. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, oh his name just went out of my head, so I'm going to embarrass myself. We have a good friend of this show who's Irish. We met at Gafcon, who wrote and who gave an interview with the Australian Church Record. Mm -hmm. uh, about the state of the church in Ireland. And he basically said, Southern Ireland the, is probably now one of the least Christian parts of Europe. The Catholic Church and the Church of Ireland are dead. Absolutely dead. The Christian, Christian Catholic Ireland is only now found in the movies and in novels. Yeah. It's a pagan atheist society. It's like Quebec. And one generation poof, has disappeared. And whose fault? Now this... And this guy, he's up in Belfast. He's got a church of a thousand plus people that is faithful to the gospel of the scripture. His problem is, I don't have enough parking. Mm -hmm. uh, not, I don't have any people. I don't have enough parking. I don't know what to do with all these people. And it comes down to the faithfulness to the Bible and scripture is delivered. You know, you, you read about the Church of England, all these initiatives, and all the things, changes they're going to do. They had this th thing, we're going to support church planning. However, we're going to make these rules. A church plant must work in concert with the local congregation, supporting them financially and deferring to the Episcopal and Archdiaconal oversight. Okay. That'll work. That'll work. You, you build a church plant, you bring people to Christ, and the local cranky guy who's driven that people out of his church for 25 years wants a cut of your income he huh? so he can keep his salary going. You think that's going to fly? No, 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 no. George, I think we've uh, <clears throat> upset enough Roman Catholics, but not so much as well, Pope Francis about, did. Well, what? Can we talk about Canadian Catholics? Just, <laughs> just, just so we double down. Uh, doubling down, Kevin. 
<laughs> you got in so much trouble last week for throwing the Catholics under the bus. I was not going to defend you. Mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Did you read some of the comments? Uh, uh, the you're always in trouble. <laughs> All right. I forgot at the beginning of the show to mention that you need to like this episode, share this episode, comment if you want, subscribe. And for those p younger people, younger than George and I, uh, who listen to podcasts, you can now download the podcast. The information is in the show notes. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 424 of Anglican. <laughs>